Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Our message today is... Please remain seated. Our sermon text for this morning is our first lesson from Genesis chapter 18, which was read before, and I'll be reading through it during the sermon. Peace with God is yours through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Amen. Dear children of the Heavenly Father, I'm guessing that many, most of you have a friend in your life that at one time you were, you were very close to. Maybe that was a, a friend from school, someone that you graduated with, someone who shared a job with you at one point, someone from a, a, a different home, a different neighborhood where you used to live Maybe you've moved to a new house or a new state. Some of those friends were ones that you shared deep concerns with. You, you bore your heart to them. And they were close friends, which means that they understood you. They, they, they knew how you felt. They got you. And maybe even had excellent wisdom to share with you or just just a shoulder for, for you to, to vent, someone an ear for you to vent to. Many of those friends we're very close with for a time, but as time goes on, maybe circumstances change, maybe you move, maybe you change jobs, maybe there was, there was not even any like, fight or anything that broke the two of you apart or, or severed your friendship, but time and distance just wear the friendship away and eventually that friendship cools and, and maybe even dies. Have you ever been in the situation then where for some reason one day you're thinking about that friend and you pick up the phone and you're thinking about calling them? Maybe you dream up a reason for why you're calling today and you're going to apologize that it's been so long, maybe months, maybe years, maybe even decades since you've spoken to this close friend. And then as you look at your phone, you, you begin to think, well, I don't even know if I have their right number. They may have changed their number since the last time that I talked to them, and, and maybe, it, maybe it's not a good time to talk right now. Maybe they're busy. I should probably wait till this evening or, or maybe even wait till, till next weekend. They could have something going on. And then by the, by the time you actually call them, if you do even go through with it and actually dial their number and call them, you're just hoping to leave them a message on their answering machine or voicemail. You ever been in that situation? Does your prayer life ever feel like that? Do you struggle to pick up the phone and call your Heavenly Father? You wonder what you might say, why you're calling now. The Bible tells us that we should pray continually. And you feel guilty that you have not been spending that much time in conversation with your Lord. Why is prayer so difficult? Shouldn't it be easy? Shouldn't it be simple? Shouldn't it be straightforward? It's so, I mean, children can do it. Why is it so hard? Why do we struggle? Today, God has a lesson to teach us about this episode of prayer from Genesis chapter 18. And here God teaches us that his children do struggle in prayer. Sometimes we struggle because we're weak sinners, but always the privilege to struggle with God in prayer is a gift of his grace. Listen to these words from Genesis chapter 18. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom. That refers to the two angels that came with the Lord to visit Abraham. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. 
Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous and the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again he spoke to him, what if only 40 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, May may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. Wow. What an amazing opportunity Abraham had to stand on that hilltop and speak with the Lord in prayer. Prayer? (laughs) Can we really call this prayer? Yeah, yeah, this is how God wants us to think of our prayers, a one-on-one chat with the Lord Almighty about what's going on in our lives, about our concerns, about his plans for us. What a privilege Abraham had to stand there on that hilltop and talk with God about his almighty plans for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the region around them. And do you know what? That same invitation stands for you and me too to approach God in prayer and speak to him one-on-one. But we can all think of excuses why not to do that. I haven't prayed in such a long time. It wouldn't be right for me to start calling on God now. Maybe you think, my request is too small. I don't want to bother God with these little nitpicky things. Or maybe just the opposite is true. You think, my request is too big. I mean, the doctors said that there's nothing that we can do for Aunt Shirley. We can't go praying for miracles every day, can we? Sometimes we think we just don't have time. We're too busy. There's too much else going on. When really there's always time for prayer. I tell our students in catechism class that we often fold our hands and bow our heads and close our eyes as I teach my children to do, especially for meal prayers and such, because it helps keep us focused, but it's not 100% necessary in order to have a prayer. Notice Jesus didn't teach that to his disciples when he taught them the Lord's Prayer. You can pray while you're driving down the road. Please don't close your eyes. Or fold your hands at that point either. Pray when you're at a stoplight. Pray when you're waiting for your computer to update. So many opportunities to pray, and yet we find so many excuses. So often we treat prayer as the last option. Oh, there's nothing left to do now but pray. And even if you are someone who is frequent in your prayers, can you actually say, my prayer life is very healthy right now and I'm doing a good job? We're all short in our prayer life. All these doubts and troubles that enter into our minds in regards to prayer certainly do not come from God's word or from a lack of promises on his behalf. Even just doing a short word study on the promises God lays out for us in regard to prayer should cause our eyes to bug out of our head with the amazing gifts that he promises to us. He says that he will do whatever you ask in Jesus' name. 
almost like God is giving you a blank check. He promises to hear and answer and act when we call on him in the day of trouble. Psalm 50, 15. James tells us that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And James also lets us know what happens when we fail to come to God in prayer and fail to trust in him. He says, you do not have because you do not ask God. The truth is that what makes coming to our Lord in prayer difficult is our sin. Sin acts as a barrier between you and your loving Heavenly Father. Isaiah tells us in chapter 59 that sin separates us from God. If you think back before sin, think back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and the wonderful relationship that they enjoyed with God, a perfect relationship with him, which is the way that God wanted and still wants today, wants it to be. They would walk with him in the garden in the cool of the day. And they would talk with him like good friends do. Their, their will, their emotions, and, and their actions were, were in line with one another. They shared like good friends do. But then what happened? Adam and Eve put their own sinful desires ahead of God's good commands for them, and they broke that perfect friendship. They broke that perfect relationship that they had with the Lord. They turned their backs on him and decided to go their own way. They separated themselves from him with sin. And that's what you and I do every time we sin. We choose ourselves rather than our relationship with God. It's no wonder that prayer is a struggle for us. I mean, what did Adam and Eve do the next time that they had an opportunity to talk to God, right? They heard him coming. They ran and hid. That's the natural reaction of a sinful heart when you have the opportunity to speak one-on-one with the holy God is run and hide. We don't deserve to approach the holy God in prayer and speak to him as his children. We deserve for him to banish us from his presence forever, not just kick us out of his throne room or push us, exile us from his kingdom, but we deserve for him to punish us in hell for eternity for the way that we have sinned against him. I mean, think back to that friendship that we started the sermon out with. Some of our friendships fizzle off just because of time, even if you haven't broken that friendship with some great offense with our God. We offend him with our sin each and every day. But you know what, Abraham, from Genesis chapter 18, he is no different than us. He was a sinner who did not deserve to be in God's presence, just like you and me. But something's different about this man. Something gave him the courage. Something gave him the motivation to go and approach the holy God. He fully knew who that was. And he spoke to him boldly and confidently. What changed? What gave him the motivation? How could he speak to the Lord? I'll tell you. The answer was God's grace. The same grace that moved God to promise a Savior to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to heal that relationship is the same grace that moved God to come to Abraham and visit him at his tent and promise him that not only would he have a son, but that one day that same Savior for his sin and mine would come from his family. Abraham could approach God like he does in these verses because he knew he had a Savior who would take all of his sins away, just as God has done for you and for me. That same forgiveness is ours today. God fixed that relationship between you and him. God took all of your sins out of the way that were blocking your relationship with him. And that means that you can approach the holy God as your heavenly father in prayer. As Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, because we've been justified through faith in Jesus, we now have access to God. Without Jesus' righteousness, without forgiveness for our sins, there is no access to God. But because of Jesus' righteousness, because of the forgiveness that he has given us, you and I have complete access to him. 
And that's a promise that we can firmly stand on when we come to God in our prayer. We have to admit like Abraham, Lord, I do not deserve to talk to you. I am only dust and ashes in your sight. But because of my Savior Jesus and the promises that you give me through him, I know I can boldly ask you for these great gifts. That's what it means to pray in Jesus' name. Praying not trusting in your own merit or your own good works or your own healthy prayer life, but praying trusting that God will answer your prayers because of Jesus' sake, because Jesus took away your sins and because Jesus promised that he would. Standing on those firm promises of God, we can trust just as Abraham did that God has heard us and he will answer our prayers. Now I want you to think back to Abraham for a moment. And answer this question, did God answer Abraham's prayer? Here we have all these verses, Abraham pouring out his prayer to the Lord. Did God answer him? We hear God speaking back to Abraham. But during this prayer, Abraham is asking God to spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah on account of the believers who may be living in that area. And six times, Abraham comes to God and asks him, each time lowering the number if he would be more lenient on how many believers would be necessary to spare the entire region. And six times the Lord answers back to him, yes, for that many, I'll, I'll, if I find that many, I'll spare the whole region. But then what happened? Maybe you know the rest of the story. Maybe this is a new one for you. Most people, I think, have heard of what has happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. They're not known for thriving cities to this day. God rained down burning sulfur from heaven and destroyed not only the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, but the entire region there by the the Dead Sea. And he destroyed everyone and absolutely everything that was living in the region. Imagine then how Abraham felt. We hear... A chapter later in the book of Genesis, early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down the hill toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. How would you feel if you were Abraham? You went back to the very place where you had prayed to the Lord, and you saw literally what you had prayed for going up in a cloud of smoke. And if we think about the way things rolled out, even before Abraham prayed his prayer, God's plan of action was already in place. The two men who left, the two angels that left their company and went down to the city of Sodom, they were going to get Lot. God's plan was already rolling. God already knew what he was going to do. You have to wonder then, what was the point of recording this for us? What was the point of this whole prayer? Why did God have this incident written down for us? If you're going to teach someone about the power of God and about him answering prayer, this seems like a horrible story to tell someone. Abraham prays for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and they're destroyed like crazy, like never before. But God had this story written down for us, this account, to teach us a lesson. Why did God have these words recorded for us today? I would suggest that the answer to that question is found just before the verses that we began reading with today. God wonders aloud there in those verses, should I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do for Sodom and Gomorrah? And he answers his question. He's going to reveal his plan to Abraham. For I have chosen him, he said, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Now think about how Abraham would have felt as he looked down at those cities burning in a big cloud of smoke. Abraham trusted that the Lord kept his promises and that the Lord answered his prayer. So Abraham would know confidently that there were not ten righteous people living in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he'd hear from his nephew Lot about how God had sent the angels and rescued him and his family from Sodom before it burned. Abraham would know that even though 
Things didn't play out the way that he had thought. God did answer his prayer. He didn't sweep away the righteous with the wicked. And Abraham's trust in the Lord would be strengthened. Do you remember what God said about Abraham directing his children after him to walk in the way of the Lord? Fast forward 15 years. What would Abraham tell his teenage son Isaac about that day that he got to stand with the Lord on that hillside and pray? What would Abraham teach his son about prayer? He would tell him about the privilege that you and I have to approach God in prayer. He would tell his boy about how God hears when we call on him and that we should keep coming back to him in prayer again and again and holding him to his promises until he gives us what we ask for. Just imagine the lesson that Abraham learned that day rolling through his head as he walked up Mount Moriah to lay his only son Isaac on the altar and sacrifice him to the Lord. Do you think Abraham was praying that day? What prayer do you think was rolling through his head? Please, God, provide a way. And what's Abraham's answer that day? The Lord will provide. He was confident that the Lord would answer his prayer. And again, God did. So why did God allow Abraham to struggle in prayer as he faced Sodom and Gomorrah? He did it, and he had it recorded for us so that Abraham would grow in his trust in the Lord and tell his children and his children, their children after them of the privilege that we have to struggle in prayer as children of Abraham by faith. This account of Abraham's prayer to the Lord does not teach us Christians to think about prayer as some magic tool that we can use. We magically say the words and poof, God gives us what we want and all of our problems are gone. This would be a horrible story to teach that. Prayer is not a magic code or a secret art that only pastors know. Prayer is a conversation between you and a living being, your heavenly father who knows you inside and out, who has plans for you, and who wants you to struggle with him in prayer. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have an amazing privilege to pray. Not everyone has that privilege. Many people are separated from God by their sins and remain separated from him. Many people like all those living in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah cannot pray for themselves, but you can pray for others. By God's grace, you have the right as sons and daughters of the Lord to approach him daily, hourly, continually in prayer. So then isn't it about time you picked up the phone? Isn't it about time you gave your heavenly father a ring? Guilt-free. He's not holding your sins against you. He's not going to grind you under his thumb because this is the first time you've come to him in a while. You can pick up that phone and dial at any moment. He's waiting. He wants you to approach him. He wants you to speak to him. He wants you to hold him to his promises and be persistent. He will listen. He will act. He will always keep his promises. Amen. Please stand. May the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Join us for worship at the following times, like us on Facebook, or visit our website for audio and video sermons or to find out more about our congregation. God bless your week in the Lord.